A champion is bred from hard times, scarred mind standing on the ledge. The squad grind all time, victory in spite of opposition. Welcome to competition. You pick a side, I pick a side, they pick a side. Take a knee against abuse, they rather you die. Pushing through dark tunnels, trying to shed light. The fight is on the moment we enter the game of life. Get it right for the whole thing, gone dead. Let's go ahead and take it there. Meet me on the edge. Welcome to Edge of Sports, the TV show, only on the Real News Network. Today we are talking to perhaps the most accomplished basketball writer ever, longtime Sports Illustrated scribe and best-selling author Jack McCallum. We will discuss his new book, The Real Hoosiers, Crispus Attucks High School, Oscar Robertson, and the Hidden History of Hoops, and more, believe me. Let's go to him now. Jack McCallum, thank you so much for joining us here on Edge of Sports TV. My honor, Dave. Great to be Uh, here. So let's just start with the book, The Real Hoosiers. Uh, Talk to us about what this book is and how you came upon this project. Well, it's a story of it's both a, I hope, a political, cultural, economic story, but I'm not smart enough to carry that thread all the way through. So it's also a basketball story. It begins, Dave, with kind of sort of the origin of this high school named Christmas Attucks High School in Western Indianapolis that was built as a segregated school in the 1920s because the same replacement theory we hear now, every place you have the word migrants, you could substitute the word African-Americans that A lot of blacks were coming from the South and other places in the Great Migration to work in the factories of Indianapolis. And the city fathers, particularly the school board of Indianapolis, was worried that they were being replaced, that there was this overflow of black students coming in and mixing with the white kids. And Indianapolis was justifiably proud of its uh, educational system. I mean, they did have good public schools, they were subtly segregated. You know, a lot of black kids just didn't go to school. I mean, they began working Mm -hmm. when they were in eighth grade and ninth grade. So they built this high school and everybody thought it would fail because it had, uh, you know, insufficient resources, secondhand equipment, uh, all the things that you give a school that's not your priority. But strangely, in an FU of epic proportions, the educated uh, African-Americans who had master's degree, in some cases PhDs, or at least bachelor's degrees, began saying, this is a good place to teach. Um, Mm -hmm. We can't get jobs at white universities. They still have to pay us the public school, at least the school district had to adhere to public school money. And so this incredible faculty flooded to Christmas Attucks High School when it opened in 1927. By three decades later, uh, it had become a kind of basketball story because the same revolution that happened to African-American education started to happen in basketball with the ascension of this coach named Ray Crow and the ascension of these players. Two of them were named Robertson, the last one named Oscar. And when he hit the scene, in 1953, as a sophomore, uh, all bets were off, and it became mm. this great basketball story. Yeah, I look forward to talking to you about Oscar and the basketball story. But before we get there, the first thing that captured me about the book, you had me before page one, because you start with this magisterial quote from W.E.B. Du Bois and his 1903 classic, The Souls of Black Folk. And... Really quickly, I want to read the quote for the audience um, and hoping you can explain why on a so-called hoops book, you would start with such words. Here's the quote. A new vision began gradually to replace the dream of political power, a powerful movement, the rise of another ideal to guide the unguided, another pillar of fire by night after a clouded day. It was the ideal of book learning, the curiosity born of compulsory ignorance to know and test the power of the Kabbalistic letters of the white man, the longing to know. Here at last seemed to have been discovered the mountain path to Canaan, 
longer than the highway of emancipation and law, steep and rugged, but straight, leading to heights high enough to overlook life. Wow. What, wow. It, I mean, you explained in your first answer, I think people get the context of why you would say something like that. But can, can you speak a little more about it? Well, two things, uh, Dave. My, my, uh, when I told my son, who's, uh, who you probably crossed paths with, is a sociology professor, I told him about this idea of the book. And he went, oh, well, you have not W.E.B. Du Bois in it, right? <laughs> I said, well, um, <laughs> you know, I certainly know about the souls of black folk, folk. I can't say that I read it all the way through. I immediately got it and started reading it. And throughout the book and throughout the high, the history of Christmas Attics High School, there became kind of this tension as to whether they were going to be more Du Bois, which was sort of a revolutionary intellectual approach to education, or they were going to be more Booker T. Washington, the sort of classic working class hero that we have to make this a vocational school that mm. we have to do the best we can and we got to turn out carpenters and laborers. And Du Bois was saying, no, 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 we have to turn out thinkers and politicians. So it became, I, I'm not smart enough to turn this into a, a, phil a completely philosophical book, but that undertone of what kind of high school we were going to be that was really, that was not an invented thing. That was a very strong thing in the early years of Christmas Attics. And quite frankly, uh, you know, if you were a working class black family, uh, you had a lot to say for going to Booker T. Washington. But we, we got to get a job. You know, mm -hmm. we got to learn how to work within the white man system. So I think this tension between Du Bois and... Booker T. Washington, which I'm not saying is resolved, but I think the fact there was this very tension and dialectic about it really helped grow that high school and produce all these remarkable people out of uh, Christmas Addicts High School. Amazing. So how long uh, did you know even the basics of the Christmas Addicts history before um, embarking upon this book? Uh, even the most basics, the, the all-black team that won two championships in the shadow of the Klan. How much of this did you know? Not much. And and I find, uh, you know, I understand the, uh, if anybody bothers to write my obituary, the second sentence is, oh, this is the guy that wrote uh, Dream Team, you know, Michael Magic Larry, the era of basketball, which you and I have talked about, you know, a hundred times. Yeah. And I get that, and that's fine. But it's sort of like I, I never wanted to be, oh, I was just that guy that covered basketball in the 80s and happened to have this great fortune of coming along during that golden age. So I was looking for uh, another story, Dave. And the, the story I came upon, it was during the pandemic and I was knee ha rehabbing my knee. And like everybody else, I was in this sort of existential crisis of, you know, sort of re-examining things. And I started researching, of all things, the history of lynching. I mean, you can't yeah. have a more uglier subject. And I came upon this story in Marion, Indiana, of a team that had won the bas state basketball championship in 1926. Four years later, hung two black men uh, in the same town square where they celebrated. I became kind of fascinated with that story, wanted to do a book on it. And uh, examined it a little bit and it just wasn't it didn't feel like me and a number of people told me I, I don't think you need somebody else you know white splaining the horrible history of lynching in America it was too it was too raw of a story you know it was George Floyd a lot of things were going on and it was the wrong book and during the course of looking at I went to Mary in Indiana a few times mm -hmm. did the research have this much research that I, you know, still have about that. But I found the attic story with which I was vaguely familiar. Oh, that's the team that was sort of connected to the movie Hoosiers. And was that the team? Was Oscar the guy in the movie? And so when I started researching and I said, wow, this is just an amazing story, the way it unravels. 
and the extent to which the white narrative, a fictional narrative, has overtaken this black narrative. And hey, I'm responsible for it too. I mean, I never wrote anything about Crispus Attucks, yet I have certainly written two or three, uh, you know, encomiums to Hoosiers. So uh, I thought it was a good book to pursue in that sense. Yeah, let's take a second and talk about Hoosiers. Uh, G- Gene Hackman is coach Norman Dale. Uh, the first time you saw Hoosiers, what was your reaction to that film? Well, I'd look, I'd be a hypocrite if I, and I've just had an, this is very fresh for me because I just had an exchange of emails with Angelo Pizzo, who wrote the movie, mm. and I've known Angelo for years. And he was not happy with everything I wrote in the chapter, uh, sort of delineating the the truth and the differences between the movie Hoosiers and the reality of Christmas Addicts. But I would be a hypocrite if I now said, well, it was terrible. It overtook the, hey man, Gene Hackman, he's like the greatest actor to me, seriously, literally the greatest actor that I've ever seen. And the story, the way it begins, coming into the town. Uh, I grew up in the 1950s, not in Indiana, but in a small New Jersey town, fell in love with basketball. Uh, certainly, I was fortunate enough that I went to a, you know, a, a very much of a mixed race high school, but I certainly grew up playing basketball with a lot of white guys and hearing a lot of white coaches teach me basketball the fundamental way. And, you know, breaking into gymnasiums that look like the Hickory High Gymnasium. So I I loved the movie and I get it. I really, really, you know, get its place. But I did start to notice that in the post-George Floyd era, smarter people than me were taking a different reckoning of it, that it comes across a different way to people. And it is certainly fair to re-examine those ways that things have changed. And I told Angelo uh, and Pizzo in this email, I said, look, man, uh, things are going to change. Things are going to people are going to analyze it differently. But if 50 years from now, you still have a movie that people are going to be looking at. And if they draw something from there that you didn't intend Hey, man, that's Mm -hmm. just the way it goes. But I did not I don't I'd be too hypocritical if I said, uh, oh, everything is wrong with uh, with Hoosiers. I'm just I'm not that guy. Well, yeah, I mean, it's been almost 40 years since it dropped. So, you know, like like Muhammad Ali said, if you haven't changed in 40 years, then you're still in the same place. Um, (laughs) So can you lay out for people who maybe aren't familiar with Hoosiers, like from a 2024 lens, what's problematic about the film? Well, uh, first of all, Hoosiers was drawn not from an original source. When Angelo and the director, David Anspaugh, who are Hoosiers themselves, still Indiana IU basketball season ticket holders, uh, they, they didn't have a book or a movie that they took it from, as like Jeff Perlman wrote uh, Showtime and they made the HBO special from. There wasn't a book out there. There was this story of the gritty uh, white small team from Milan High School that had won the state championship in 1952. That was definitely the raw material. That was the raw material for the book, the story of that team. I think a couple things that need to be noted, however, was the template and the paradigm for winning the Indiana State Basketball Championship was that kind of team. Mm. By that point, Indiana State Basketball Tournament had been played since uh, 1911, I think. So most of these champions that triumph were these gritty white teams that had played together from the time they were in second and third grade, played very, very fundamental basketball. Indianapolis, the sco- uh, in, as a school, as a school district, had never won a state championship until Addicts won it. So the idea that these guys were the outsiders, you know, the little kids 
that somehow overcame great odds. And don't get me wrong, Milan High School was a small high school. I'm not getting, don't get that wrong. However, there were other teams like them that won the state mm. championship. And the real outsiders coming into this thing were the black schools. Mm. That they, first of all, it was a very new phenomenon. They were kept by a catch 22 rule. Black schools were kept from competing in the state tournament uh, for the first 30 years of the tournament. They didn't start coming into it until 1942 or 1943. It's uh, in the book. Some of the dates are escaping me. So all those years, they were kept out of the tournament. So those kind of background and story were were not in Hoosiers. But, you know, I said in the book, uh, Angelo and David Anspaugh, they wrote the story. They wrote their truth. That was mm -hmm. that was their truth. After I wrote Dream Team, a couple of people said to me, why the hell didn't you write the story of the Lithuanian team? You know, the team that had suffered more under the heel of the Russian uh, captor and had their own bloody Sunday and had to raise money. I said, good point. I hope somebody writes that book. That's not the book that I wrote. But uh, at this time and place, I think it's time that we unraveled uh, the fact and fiction from Hoosiers, since it is an indisputable fact that the white narrative of Hoosiers has overtaking, overtaken the black reality of Christmas addicts. So this book, in, in part, is an attempt to straighten that out. Amazing. It's like uh, Howard Zinn uh, <laughs> wrote through Yeah, this is fingers. the people's it's, history. <laughs> it is like a people's history of Indiana basketball. Now, one of the great figures in the book, and to, to the audience out there, you got to get this book. It's as good a basketball book as I've ever read. Um, Oscar, and it's not just a basketball book. Um, Oscar Robertson is so much a part of this story. Who was Oscar then? And who is the Oscar who you have been around for so many years? The Oscar then, and pretty much the Oscar that I haven't been around Oscar now as much as I would have liked. And I think one mm -hmm. of the ways to sort of define Oscar is that he and Jerry West were so much the magic and bird of their time, white player, black player, great dominated college basketball, came into the league together. Oscar was the number one pick. Jerry was the number two pick. Jerry, in since 1960, when they came into the league, that's 64 years ago, Jerry West has rarely been absent from the NBA, not just because you know, he's literally the figure, you know, literally the symbol of the game. Uh, player, uh, coach, general manager, consultant, Jerry's been there. Oscar, pretty much divorced from the league. Never a coach, uh, never a general manager. Had this team that he went to, the Cincinnati Royals, which became, you know, who are they? Kansas City, mm -hmm. Sacramento. Never knew exactly who to honor him with, you know, won his championship with Kareem and Milwaukee. So they represent these two kind of parallel courses. So the Oscar that came into Crispus Attucks as a sophomore was smart, disciplined, determined. I hate to use the word angry because that conjures up this I'm not going to listen to anybody else, and I'm pissed off from the beginning. But Oscar was not a sweet man. Mm -hmm. Somebody told me, and uh, one of the players, that uh, historian from uh, Indianapolis named Stanley Warren, a uh, great scholar, said, Oscar got a lot to be pissed off about, and he's pissed off. <laughs> mm. He wasn't forgetting these things that happened to him. And so when it came time, I knew from dealing with Oscar a little bit uh, for Sports Illustrated that he just wasn't happy with the media, whether it would be the uh, Caucasian media or media in general. He just thought that uh, his story has never been told accurately. He worries that the Crispus Attucks narrative has been lifted from him 
and his teammates and taken over by, you know, certainly the Hoosiers narrative. He's pissed about that. And I tried eight to 10 times to talk to him for the book. And he finally wrote back and said, uh, good luck with your project. I will not be cooperating, which from the beginning was perhaps based on my previous interactions with Oscar, uh, was really not the surprising outcome. Now, I can rationalize, and, and I am, and saying I think it's just as good a book without him. I didn't want to do a biography of Oscar. That's not what I was looking to do. But uh, something inside my job at Sports Illustrated was always to get to the guys. Mm. <laughs> you know, that's what I... That's what I did. When I did Dream Team, the biggest challenge was not writing the book. The biggest challenge was making sure I got all 12 of those guys to sit down and talk to me and pour out their feelings. Mm. Fortunately, I was able to do that. So there's a little part of me uh, that is uh, disenchanted that Oscar it was not personally a part of this, even though obviously he's all through the book. Mm. Now, Oscar Robertson was also a, a labor trailblazer uh, and, and a rebel in that regard. Uh, is, do you see any common threads between the person he was at Crispus Attucks and the the rebel that he was in the NBA? No, no question. Oscar came from this from this area, this this part of town. Uh, he played at a this playground called the Dust Bowl, which by the time he got there was not really dusty. It was in the west side of town. It had been established by the these two black policemen, the Police Athletic League, and it hatched this incredible basketball culture. It's as, as important as it's it's Rucker, it's Rucker Park, you know, 20 years before that hatched to Dr. J and uh, Connie Hawkins and all those kinds of people. So the person that grew up there, tough leader, always looking, Larry Fleischer, the great union leader, told Oscar at one point, you have exactly the attribute you need to be a labor leader. Mm. You, you have a complete distrust of the other side. <laughs> you, don't, you, you are programmed to believe that whatever they say is bullshit. You know, mm -hmm. and that's Oscar weighs everything. And, you know, Dave, uh, there's a great quote in the book that Ray Crow, his coach, died before he was one of the many people died before I could was long dead before I could talk to them. But this quote that I always was running through my head as I as I wrote the book was Ray goes, Oscar, he just ran the game. Mm -hmm. He just ran the game. And I, I've said that. If you could get 20 players out there, the greatest players of all time, uh, Magic, Michael, uh, Larry, LeBron, Steph, get them all out there at one time. I guarantee you that when they were going to pick teams, Oscar would pick it up and go, all right, man, who's on my team? Because hmm. I'm running this shit. You know? <laughs> That's sort of how he was as a uh, as a player and that's how he was as a leader. He took it very seriously. And the name that on the lawsuit that gave the NBA free agency, it would have happened eventually. There's no question about that. But it happened quicker because of a suit called Oscar Robertson versus the National Basketball Association. His name is on that lawsuit. Wow. I, I could talk to you this whole time about Oscar Robertson, but um, I, I, I want to get back to the book. You've mentioned Ray Crow several times, uh, and he's such a great character in the book. Who was Ray Crow, and what was his sense of mission with regards to Crispus Attucks? Well, Ray was a guy who grew up in Indianapolis. He is the brother of George Crow, who back in the 50, well, back before I started this project, I would have known George Crow, great baseball player. I remember him big muscular pinch hitter for the Cincinnati Reds. Ray was part of a big family. They grew up in the, as I said in the book, the appropriately named White Land, Indiana, as this only black family in town. So Ray grew up with uh, white people. That's how he went to school. He was a smart kid, got to college, did go to a, a black school. But his upbringing was sort of uh, this guy who 
knew how to get along in both worlds, you know, that he had been brought through a white school system, got a job coming out of uh, college and it wasn't paying anything. And somebody said, why don't you go be a teacher? And he was a smart guy. He got a job teaching at Christmas Attics. And one of the threads of the book, Dave, is that Christmas Attics High School as an all black high school playing against mostly white teams had to figure out how to comport itself. You know, did they act like they were on the, there was always this worry that they would be too black, that they would be too playground. So this culture was kind of hatched at Christmas Attics High School that was very polite. They played basketball like very politely, Uh, you know, hands off on defense, didn't do a lot of running, uh, guarded your man, but stayed off of him a little bit. And that was the philosophy imparted by the previous coach. So when Ray Crow got there, uh, Ray had to figure out how to thread this needle. Mm. He had to figure out how to still comport to what the principal and the the administrators at Christmas Attics, and by extension, all of Indianapolis school system, how they wanted the black team to comport themselves versus what the hell he had to do to win the basketball game. His perfect player was Oscar Robertson, because here's a guy, complete fundamental player, completely disciplined, yet five times better than anybody else. And one of the things your viewers can do is very easily YouTube clips, uh, Christmas Attics High School, Indiana State High School championships back from the 50s. And just like getting old, you know, REM videos on YouTube, you can get these basketball games up. And Oscar comes along, boom, it's like this evolution. He's just playing games differently. He gets from here to here quicker. He makes this pass quicker and cuts immediately to the basket. I know these sounds all basic things, but basketball, as Larry Bird used to say, is a pretty damn simple game. You know, you just got to do these things better than anybody else. Oscar did them better than anybody else from the time he was sophomore by the time he was a senior and Attics was including its run to the concluding its run to the second straight championship. He he was so far and away. uh, You could have come from outer space and looked down at this game for a minute and go, well, uh, this guy's playing it. This guy's playing it differently than everybody else. Wow. The book is The Real Hoosiers, Christmas Attics High School, Oscar Robertson and the Hidden History of Hoops. I, 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 this book is such a towering achievement. I'd be so remiss if I didn't ask you one last question, Jack. Uh, it's a two-parter. What advice do you have for young book authors? And did you ever doubt you could pull this book off? Because it's an incredible blend of social history and sports, and that's not an easy thing to do. Well, certainly the second one, I had extreme doubts because uh, when I start out doing a book, I'd be interested in what you say about this, because you're more of a, uh, you know, not more of a political, historical, that is your lens. And I was talking about my son earlier. He always asked, well, what's your argument? What's your thesis in the book? What are you trying to prove? And I always tell him the same thing. I, I just. I try to tell a story. (laughs) That's what I found that I can do best. What is a way to tell this story? And for me, it came very early. The first time I went to Indianapolis, I walked through the halls of Christmas Attics High School. And there were these pictures on the wall of each uh, graduating class. And I didn't start with Oscar Robertson. I started in the 20s. And it was like, holy crap, I am just drawn in by this history. And I said, I can tell this story. I can tell this story through this feeling I have about the history of this high school. So I was very lucky to get uh, that beginning. So far as advice for, uh, for young writers is I do think in this world where, uh, you know, Sports Illustrated has cratered and daily newspapers have cratered. There is still this incredible thirst 
for people to learn about things. I'm sure you find this out yourself. Absolutely. But you're, you're kind of astounded. Now, how big is that audience? That's a good question. It's not going to be the James Patterson or the John Grisham audience, but you have to think to yourself, if you're able to tell this story, and I think uh, one of the things that has become a little lacking in communication or journalism or the way we do things is curiosity. Mm -hmm. I always found that, uh, I, you know, the two books I'm proudest of are probably this one and a book I did about my own prostate cancer because I'm not a doctor and I had to find everything about that. You know, I had to find everything myself. This question leads to that question. So I would say if you start out with an essential curiosity, rather with the idea that I know everything there is to know about this subject, uh, you will write stories successfully and people will be interested in them. Mm. Well, my favorite Jack McCallum book was Seven Seconds or Less, but now I have to amend that and say The Real Hoosiers, Crispus Attucks High School, Oscar Robertson and the Hidden History of Hoops is it's not just my favorite of your books. I think it's my favorite basketball book now, which is to me pretty high praise because I think basketball has produced some of the most beautiful writing uh, in the entire sports world. Um, Jack McCallum, thank you so much for joining us here on Edge of Sports TV. It's a total honor. Well, my honor was mine, Dave. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.